Okay, so this is all about chapter six, uh, descriptive uh, research. Under descriptive research uh, designs, uh, we have uh, four different categories. We have observation studies, correlational research design, developmental uh, design, and then the research uh, design. So these are the components of uh, descriptive research designs. We look up into quantitative observation uh, studies, although in some textbooks uh, we have quantitative observation studies, we have also qualitative observation studies. But in this chapter, it is only limited to quantitative observation studies. Now, under this uh, research design, normally this involves humans, people, persons, students, learners, then other animals, plants can be included in the observation, then non-living objects can also be in, in quantitative observation studies. We have to be very careful when we involve humans and even other animals uh, because uh, we have some ethical considerations. Uh, when uh, we involve uh, people, when we involve human beings and other animals in uh, certain studies, not only in quantitative observation, but all other types of research designs uh, that uh, are actually involving human beings or other forms of animals. Uh, we have uh, human rights. Uh, animals have also have also rights. Uh, so we have to respect the rights of animals. We have to respect the rights of human beings. So in uh, a research process, we consider ethical considerations or ethical standards, uh, which uh, we will be talking later about how to deal about ethical standards in conducting different research uh, designs. The focus is limited because uh, the, the variables, characteristics of human beings are actually many and we could not afford to consider all of those characteristics. So we have to limit the focus of the characteristics that we are going to study for human beings, for animals, for plants, and even non-living objects. So in one of the parts or in one of the sections, of uh, a test dissertation is all about scope and limitation. So in the scope, you are going to indicate on um, what are the poci, the focuses of uh, your research, what variables are included in the study. And uh, as I mentioned, you have to limit the number of variables that you are going to include in the study. Why? Because uh, if you have so many variables, you could not afford to collect the data from all of those variables. And if even you can afford to collect data from all of those variables, then the data collection will take a long process. And if it is a long process, analysis, interpretation would take a long time also. So you might be able to interpret, you might have findings of the study to an old data. You might have collected the data way back January and up to June, you are still on the data collection because you have so many variables. So you are not able to finish that one in a shorter period of time. So some data are old already, some data are new or currently collected. So that's not a good process. So much as possible, we have to limit on the number of variables. That is why we have scope and limitation. The scope is only referring to on the variables included in the study. Pre-specified because at the beginning, you have to identify already what are the different variables, what are the different steps that you are going to consider. And all of these uh, could be based on the review of related literature. Next one is that you have to quantify behavior. Behavior or attitude might be in a qualitative perspective. However, we have a problem of converting quantitative to qualitative 
or vice versa, qualitative to quantitative perspective. So, for example, we look up into performance. Performance can be labeled as excellent performance, very good performance, good performance, uh, fair performance, or maybe poor performance. So those different uh, categories are actually qualitative. However, you can convert that one in terms of uh, quantitative. You can assign five for excellent performance, four for very good performance, three for good performance, then two for uh, fair performance, then one for poor performance. However, the quantification will be depending on the related literature that you have actually read. Then next one, require planning, attention to detail, and then time. So planning is very much important. That is why we have research proposal. In a research proposal, you are going to plan what is step number one, what is step number two, what is step number three, and focusing on the research cycle. So the cycle that I introduce is all about identifying a research problem, then going to the review of related literature, so forth and so on, up to the reporting, the sharing of the results no, of the study, then going back to the identification of uh, the research uh, problem. The next one is attention to detail and then time. No? So I mentioned about uh, the acronym SMART, no? specific, measurable, attainable, then realistic, and then time-bounded. You have to specify on the duration of uh, the study. Attention to detail, so dapat you have to be in detail on how are you going to do the entire research process. Because if you do that one in a capsule manner, then no one could understand you. The reader could not understand on what you are talking about. Remember that we are going to write not for ourselves as the, the researchers, but we are writing for our readers. So we have to be in detail when we write uh, our research proposals in any kind of uh, research design, not only in quantitative observation, but other forms of research design. So, next is uh, provide a quantitative alternative uh, to qualitative uh, approaches. So if you have qualitative approaches, uh, provide alternative uh, in terms of quantitative alternative. Why? Because we are talking about quantitative observation. Although you collect the data in a qualitative perspective, but you can quantify that one. No? And how do you quantify that one? You need to have a review of related literature on how to quantify certain variables. So qualitative, how do we quantify that one? From qualitative, how do we do the conversion? Or maybe from quantitative, how do we do the conversion to qualitative uh, perspective? And all of those things uh, would not be coming from your own stock knowledge, but you have to be dependent on the review of related literature. You might be questioned by the panel or maybe experts, uh, why do you do this? Uh, then you can reason out because according to blah, 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 this is actually how to do the conversion. And according to blah, 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 this is how to do the conversion. Everything that you do in the entire research process is actually backed up with the literature. And provided that the literature is actually a very good literature coming from reputable journal or reputable website. Maintaining objectivity in observation studies. So first, you have to define the behavior precisely and concretely. So in a thesis, we have operational definition of the terms. So variables that you consider must be defined operationally. However, if the definition of the variable is the same to the definition given by dictionaries, you don't need to define the point. If the definition of the variable is according to the general meaning of that variable, then you don't need to define it. However, if you have a special meaning of that variable, 
then you have to define that one depending on how you use uh, that variable in your study. For example, location of uh, residence. You could not find the meaning of location of residence in a dictionary. However, if you're the researcher, then how do you use that one? Like in my case, uh, I used location of residence in one of my researches conducted in the past. And I define location of residence as to the location of the residence of the respondents in terms of rural or urban. And I define what is rural and I define also what is urban. So in that study that I did in the past, uh, I define rural if the residence is located in the barangay of a certain city. Urban if that is actually located within the heart of uh, the city. So that's a very common example that you are going to define the behavior. For example, when you are going to have uh, a positive attitude and a negative attitude. So you might have a review of related literature on how do you define a positive behavior and how do you define a negative behavior. Or it might be an introvert behavior or an extrovert behavior. So you need to have some references to have a very specific or a very concrete definition of the behavior or of the variable that you are actually collecting from the subjects or the respondents of uh, the study. Next is divide the observation period into small segments. There might be a case that the population is so big and you could not afford to collect data from that big population because uh, it's actually a big one. So for example, if you are going to look at into all students of Negros Oriental State University, Norsu is actually a big one. So you have to divide that one into segments. So we can divide Norsu according to campus. So Bio 1 campus, the Shaton campus, main campus 1 campus, main campus 2, and then we have the Pamplona campus, the, the, the Baiz campus, and the Giholngan campus. So we divide that one according to campuses. However, in each campus, each campus is composed of different colleges. So we go into the division according to colleges. By campus, then according to college. So in the main campus, for example, we have College of Arts and Sciences, College of Industry. Industry. We have College yeah. of uh, Teacher Education, College of Nursing and Allied Health Sciences. Then we have the College of Arts and Sciences. So it's actually a big one when we talk about college. For example, College of Teacher Education. It is composed of five programs. So we have to divide it again into a smaller department. So in the College of Teacher Education, we have five programs. The BE Ed, the BS Ed, the BS Ned, then the BPED. The five programs. So from a big one, according to the entire university, to campuses, then from campuses to different colleges. And from a college, we go into different uh, programs. So, now, looking into a certain program, BPED, for example, or BSNED, or BTLED, or the BEN, or the BSN, it is composed of year levels. So you're going to first year, second year, and then third year. So if you look at first year, first year can be divided in terms of gender. Uh, male and then female. BE Ed can be divided according to major uh, programs. BS Ed can be divided also according to majors like sciences, uh, social studies, Filipino, math, uh, so forth and so on. And if you look at math majors, for example, we can go from first year, second year, third year, and then fourth year. If you look up into a certain year level, we can divide it according to sex or maybe according to gender. When we talk about gender, we can classify first year na straight male, first year na straight female, or first year na bi male, first year na bi female, or first year na gay, first year na lesbian, or any other categories of 
gender. So that's what we mean by divide the observation into small segments so that you can actually see the differences between and among groups in terms of behavior that you observe, in terms of attitude that you actually observe. Next is on using a rating scale to evaluate the behavior in terms of specific dimensions. So rating scale, you can have it uh, frequently observed, then uh, moderately observed, slightly observed, then not observed at all. That's an example of a rating scale. Or maybe you can have that one as excellent behavior, very good behavior or good behavior, then uh, moderately good behavior, fair behavior, or maybe a poor behavior or a bad behavior. But when you are going to use a rating scale, be sure that you have a specific definition of uh, each of the scale. So for example, when you have excellent down to poor, so you have to define what is an excellent uh, behavior what is a very good behavior what is a good behavior what is a fair behavior and what is a poor behavior because different individuals have different uh, understanding have different standards so if you are the researcher you have to tell forget your own definition of the following rating scale but follow my definition because i'm the researcher so you have to follow my definition of the following scale. Because what is actually very good for one may not be very good for other people. What is excellent for one may not be excellent for other people. So that all will have the same understanding, you're going to have that specific direction. Forget your own definition of the following scale. But all of you must follow my own definition because I'm the one conducting the research. I have my own definition of the following uh, scale. So when you rate the following items, follow the definition indicated. Do not use your own definition. Forget your own definition. If you don't do that, then you are able to collect data that is not very objective. Why not very objective? Because different respondents, different subjects have different understanding, have different definitions of the scales. However, if you do an explanation that this is my definition of excellent, this is my definition of very good, this is my definition of poor behavior, then everyone understood it. Then when they rate all the items, you're guaranteed you're very much sure that all of those are actually having the same understanding on their ratings. Train the raters to use specific criteria until consistent ratings are obtained. When you do the observation and you are the one doing the research, then there is a bias. Because you're the researcher, you're the one observing, then there is something biased in there. Because as a researcher, you might have some expectations and you can actually twist the observation. You can manipulate something about what you observe. So the best way is train raters, train observers. If uh, you, have you have 10 observers, train them how to observe and how to rate. And stop the training when everyone is able to understand and have consistency of their ratings of the behavior or the understanding of the different rating skills. So there must be a training of uh, raters. And that, uh, if you're the researcher, do not observe it by yourself because if you do the observation alone by yourself, there might be some biases. And experts would say, you're doing your own observation, you're the researcher, and you're the one observing, then there's a bias in there. Why? Because there might be a possibility, even if you claim uh, you did an objective observation, but still, you are part of it, uh, you are the one doing the research, and you are the one uh, doing the observation, you might have blind spots, uh, which you could not actually do the exact identification 
of the observation that you have actually seen, that you have actually collected. Correlational research. So I mentioned that one already. You know, in terms of correlation, we correlate that to variables. And the, the, the purpose of correlation is to determine the relationship of two variables, or maybe among three variables, or maybe among four variables. I mentioned earlier also that there are two types of correlation, the simple correlation and the multiple correlation. In our case, we're talking about simple correlation if there are two variables. And you look at the relationship of the two variables. If there are actually many variables, among three variables, among four variables, then we go into multiple correlation. So there are two types, the simple correlation and then multiple correlation. And that, there are two types of correlation. We have positive correlation and negative correlation. If the correlation is positive, that means that in the first variable, the value is high, and the second variable, the value is also high. There might be a case also that in the first variable, the value is low, and in the second variable, the, vari the variable is actually having a low value. So if you look at the two variables, uh, both are having high values, or maybe both are having low values, or the values of the two variables are going together. So we call that one as a positive correlation. However, correlation can be negative. So pag negative ang correlation, it would be that the first variable is having high value, second variable is having value, or the values of the two variables are opposite to each other. So if that happens, we call that one as a negative uh, correlation. So there are many examples of a negative correlation. For example, the law of demand and supply is an example of a negative correlation because uh, we look at the demand. If the demand is actually high, then uh, normally this, there is scarcity of the supply. If the supply, there is many supply, then what would happen? The price is actually low. But if there is a scarcity of the supply, then the price is actually high. So the values are actually opposite to each other. And that's an example of uh, a negative uh, correlation. Another one is on math ability and uh, English ability. So very common that if someone is good in math, that someone is not good in English. If that someone is not good in English, then that someone is uh, good in math. So negative, the values are opposite to each other. But there might be some cases also that the correlation is positive. Now someone is not good in math and that someone is not good in English. So the values go together. So that's an example of a, a positive correlation. Or you might find someone na good in math and good in English. So that's again an example of a positive correlation. Then scatter plots. No? I will not discuss scatter plots unless uh, you look at that one in the statistical perspective. No? If you have taken statistics, uh, scatter plots are actually very common when uh, you're going to look at the relationship between variables or maybe among uh, variables. No? But we're not going to discuss that one in detail. Then uh, we go to developmental designs. There are two categories of uh, developmental designs. We have the cross-sectional study and we have the longitudinal study. In a cross-sectional study, people from several different groups are sampled and compared. So for example, we look up into uh, we look up into we look up into a case na Certain population is divided into many categories. For example, according to sex, male and then female. So you collect data from male, you collect data from female. So that's a cross-sectional because the total population is divided into two sectors or into two segments. There might be a case that you divide the entire population into 
into civil status as a single married widow here and then separated. These are the very common values of a civil status. No? Single, married, widow, widower, and then separated. So if you have data from this five, we have single, married, widow, widower, and then separated, then you cross-section the entire population according to civil status. There might be a case that you are going to cross-section the total population in terms of gender as to straight male, then bi male, straight female, bi female, then gay, lesbians, then trans, uh, gender, so forth and so on. So you collect data from different groups. So you cross-section the entire population. And when you cross-section, you are able to dissect the data according to some characteristics of uh, the members of the population. For example, you look up into attitudes. So it is necessary that we are going to cross-section between male and then female because female and male have common attitudes and have also differences in terms of attitudes. When we look at into behavior, we can classify that one also in terms of uh, gender or according to gender. The straight male, the bi male, the straight female, the bi female, the gay, the lesbians may have different behaviors or maybe having similar behaviors. So looking into those different perspectives, you're able to dissect the data according to gender, according to sex, or maybe according to nationality, or maybe according to civil status. So the other one, in terms of longitudinal study. You know? So from the term longitudinal, meaning the study is actually over a long time. A single group of people is followed over time and data are collected at various uh, times. So for example, nutritional status normally conducted by DepEd, no? the nutritional status of basic education learners. So commonly in that study, as conducted by DepEd or even in another perspective, in another department. So grade one, there is a collection of nutritional status using an instrument. When the grade one pupils go to grade two, so the same instrument is being used to collect data about nutritional status. Then when they become grade three, so again, they collect data from uh, the same instrument about nutritional status. So, up to grade six. So, when you look at uh, the collection of the data, it, start, uh, it starts from grade one, then to grade two, then to grade three, then to grade four, to grade five, to grade six, then to grade seven, perhaps. No, So, there is what we call a longitudinal perspective over a period of six years or maybe over a period of seven years. And the interval is one year. But there might be some cases where the interval is every month. The interval is quarterly or the interval is uh, semi-annually or every six months. Uh, so depending on your review of related literature, me being a researcher, I cannot actually say uh, the interval is one year, the interval is semi-annually, the interval is quarterly, or the interval is monthly. Because uh, the interval in a longitudinal study would be depending on the review of related literature. I mentioned earlier that everything that you do must be justified, must be backed up with a literature. So why do you use... Uh, one year as the interval? Why do you use every six months as the interval? Why do you use quarterly as the interval? And then your answer, because most of the related literature is telling that the appropriate interval is six months or the appropriate interval is seven months or maybe every four months or every three months. You are not going to decide an interval according to your own line of thought. No one would believe you. Even in our case, as a practicing researcher, all that we do must be backed up with literature. 
literature that is related to the present study. So what are the pros and cons of cross-sectional versus longitudinal study? So in terms of cross-sectional studies, the pro, all the data can be collected at one time. No? You can collect the data in one time, for example, data on behavior. And then later, you can divide the data according to male or female, according to gender, or maybe according to civil status, or maybe according to income status. And then the con, different populations may represent different life experiences. That's all about threat to internal validity. That uh, if you look at different populations, uh, then the different segments are actually having different experiences. Because they differ in terms of experiences, the data that you have collected would differ also. So that's the reason why some of the tests look up into significant differences between and among variables, or maybe uh, just uh, a difference uh, between two groups of data, significant difference among three groups of data, or among four groups of data. Because all the time, differences uh, between and among populations uh, are always possible. Next, longitudinal studies. So what is the pro? Correlations between characteristics at different times can be computed. Yeah. So in a longitudinal study, for example, you collect data in grade one, then you collect data in grade two, then you can correlate the results when the subjects are still in grade one and the subjects are in grade two. You can correlate the nutritional status when they are still in grade one and the nutritional status when they are already in grade two. Or even the nutritional status when they are in grade two and when they are in grade three. Then when they are in grade five and grade six, you can correlate the nutritional status between uh, Grade 5, nutritional status, and grade 6, nutritional status. The con, participants may be lost to follow up. Uh, so characteristics uh, being measured may change because participants have experience with the, the instrument. So the first one, participants may be lost to follow up. Uh, for example, you started sa grade 1, but some will transfer, some would be dropped, or some, some dies. So when you look at a follow-up in grade 2, some of the pupils in grade 1 could no longer be traced in grade 2. And some enrolled in grade 2 could not be found anymore in grade 3 because some transferred, some dropped, or some uh, migrated to other country, or maybe some of the pupils died. So there is what we call a loss of uh, respondents or subjects for the follow-up. And that's very normal. Next is on the, 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 the familiarity of the instrument. Because if you have a longitudinal study, the instrument used in grade one and in grade two and in grade three up to grade six should be the same that uh, there should be no change of the instrument. Otherwise, you could not actually specifically measure on the significant increase or the significant decrease because you use different instrument. The instrument must be the same all throughout. If there is a six-year duration from the first year up to the sixth year, the instrument must be the same. But the problem in that case is uh, familiarity of the instrument. Because when they reach grade the three, they can actually recall and they can say, oh, that's what we use in grade two. This is what we use in grade three. So there is familiarity already based on the experience that they have through the participation when they were still in grade one or when they were still in grade three. So forth and so on. Compromise. So under compromise, we have cohort sequential design. In a cohort sequential design, addresses uh, weaknesses of longitudinal and cross-sectional designs. So includes more age groups, the cross-sectional piece, 
followed the over a period of time, the longitudinal peaks. So, so if you look at the second bullet, uh, we have two or more age brackets. So we can have their first age bracket, for example, 1 to 5, then 6 to 10, then 11 to 15. Three age brackets. So we call that one as cross-section. Then if that is actually conducted over a period of time, for example, you study that one over a period of four years, you collect data for the first year, you collect data for the second year, you collect data for the third year, you collect data for the fourth year, but the data are categorized according to the age brackets, 1 to 5, 6 to 10, then 11 to 15. So it's actually a combination of cross-sectional piece and the longitudinal piece or the cross-sectional design and the longitudinal research design. Allows calculation of correlations measures taken at two different time periods. So the same to what I mentioned earlier that uh, if you have collected the data during the first year and you have collected data in the second year, the instrument is the same you can actually correlate the two sets of data. And if you remember, we talk about person product moment coefficient of correlation and then the Spearman rank order correlation as the tool to measure correlation. Predictions can be made across time. So when we look at correlation, the result of the correlation can be used to predict on what will happen in the future. Then we have ESM, the Experience Sampling Methods. So ESM stands for Experience Sampling Method. Are you still there? Hello? Yes, 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 yes. Is the audio, is my audio clear? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you still see my slide? No. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, under ESM, so the first bullet there, an experience sampling method, ESM, is an approach in which a researcher collects frequent and ongoing data about people as they live their normal everyday lives. So unlike in the traditional one that you collect data in a specific duration of time. Now there is a starting time and then an ending time of the research process or the data collection. In the ESM, you collect the data all throughout. Meaning there is a starting point, but there is no ending point. That you actually collect data every now and then. You can collect data daily, weekly, or maybe monthly, or maybe quarterly, or maybe semi-annually, or maybe annually. And we don't say within four years, within five years, but continually. So that the data that you have collected are actually from the very beginning until the time that you want to have an analysis interpretation of the data. So ongoing ang data collection. Successfully used in both quantitative and qualitative projects. So although we talk about quantitative research designs, but this kind of uh, sampling methods, the ESM, can be both uh, quantitative and qualitative. So advantages of ESM methods. First, potential for increased accuracy and validity of assessments. Why we look at into increase of accuracy? Because, uh, for example, behavior, there's no constancy of the behavior. The data that they've collected last January to March may not be the same to the data that we will be collecting from April to June and even from July to October or maybe from November to December. There is a change over time. So if you look at ESM, you collect data every now and then. There's no specific end of the data collection. 
then that would increase the accuracy of uh, the data that you have collected. And if the increase of accuracy, there is an increase also of the validity of the assessment. Because the more recent the data that you have collected, then the more valid. If the data are very old, then you do the data analysis and interpretation, the accuracy is actually not that high. The validity is not that high. Why? Because they are old data. And people would say, or experts would say, you collected data about behavior seven months ago. But for now, it's already December. But it does not mean that those behaviors collected seven months ago could still be reflective or could still be the same at this time, no? December 2023. There might be change over time. And according to Jose Marichan, what is constant in this world is a change. Next is a researcher gains data that might be useful in determining the test retest reliability. If you were in my research, in my assessment, and even in the statistical part that we discussed, there is what we call test retest using correlation technique. Useful if the researcher wants to collect longitudinal data as a means of investigating any short-term changes in characteristic as environmental or maybe behavioral variables of a change. So for example, we have their first data collection in the first month. The second data collection is in the second month. You are going to find out what specific changes from the first month to the second month. What are the characteristics that and are these characteristics uh, due from environmental factors or is it due from behavioral variables? So when we look at attitudes, for example, or behavior, it might be environmental ang, ang factors that influence the behavior or it might be the behavior themselves no, of those people within the environment. Next is survey research design. In a survey research design, some books are calling that one as descriptive survey. Some books are calling that one as normative uh, survey. So it can be a survey design, it can be a descriptive survey, or it can be a normative uh, survey. So why do we conduct a survey? So first, we look at into the definition of survey. So when... The population is so big, you could not afford to collect data from that big population. For example, the population is 5,000. You could not afford to collect data from each of the 5,000. Because collecting data from each of the 5,000 will take money, time, and effort. For example, the questionnaire is composed of one page only. So, if the cost of uh, the production is one peso per page, so one peso times 5,000, 5,000 pesos. So production of the questionnaire is 5,000. Then when you do the data collection from one respondent to another one to another one, it would take you know, a long time. And then it would incur a big amount of money for the traveling expenses. So, Aside from the traveling expenses, it would take a long time to collect data from each of the 5,000. So it's not practical. So according to experts, because the population is so big, then we can just collect data from the sample. But we have to be sure that the sample is a representative of the population. So in statistics, we have different research designs. We have different... Uh, we have different sampling designs also according to different uh, research designs. So we'll talk about it later, about the different sampling designs. So simple design for survey research, researcher poses a series of questions. So in a statement of the problem, you have problem one, problem two, problem three, so forth and so on. Second, you are going to quantify the responses. So dapat the responses 
must be quantifiable. Or that means nga, the variable, the responses, uh, must be in terms of numbers or in terms of figures. If not in terms of numbers, not in terms of figures, you can actually you can actually convert that into quantitative uh, data. And then you are going to draw inferences about the population. So normally in a survey, we're going to apply hypothesis testing. And you will better understand hypothesis testing if you have a background about basic statistics or even advanced uh, so. Then captures a fleeting moment of time. Extrapolation can be made about a longer period of time. We call it one as prediction. From the data that you have collected, you can predict on what will happen in the future based on the data that you have analyzed, that you have interpreted, and the data are coming from the sample. So I'd like to repeat, if you collect data from the sample, that means that you do a survey. A survey is collection of data from members of the sample. But there might be a case where people have the resources. They want to collect data from the population. Because actually, when you have to collect the data from the population, that is actually the most appropriate one. But we could not afford to collect data from that big population. However, if someone has the resources all the time, no? financial resources, uh, um, time, effort, uh, then uh, you can actually do that. Uh, you are not actually prohibited to collect data from all members of the population. If you can afford it, you can collect the data in this possible time because you can train data collectors. If there are 5,000 members of the population, you have 100 data collectors, you can afford to pay the data collector and you can train them with a payment, then that is actually better. Then uh, you are not prohibited to do data collection from the entire members of the population. And if it happens that you collect data from all members of the population, we call that one a census. Census is actually a collection of data from all members of the population. So take note about those terms. So types of survey research design. So we have interview. So in the interview, it can be structured or semi-structured. When we say structured, you have already set of questions to be asked in the interview. You have a separate paper. You have their question number one, question number two, question number three, so forth and so on. And then you ask only based on what is structured in the interview guide. When we say interview guide, it is actually containing what? All the questions that you are going to ask during the interview. If it is a semi-structured, then you have written the questions to be asked during the interview. However, you can add also a follow-up question during the interview based on the responses of the person whom you are interviewing. So for example, if Maria is the one that you are actually interviewing, and then based on the response of Maria, you have some clarifications, then you ask something. But the question that you ask is not found in the link, but you ask that one during the interview based on the response of Maria. So you look at that one as a semi-structured one. Now you ask something based on what is listed in the interview guide, but you insist also on asking some clarifications, some questions based on the responses of the interviewee for better understanding. Or maybe you don't understand what is actually being told by the interviewee, so you have a follow-up question. So that makes the interview a semi-structured. Face-to-face, uh, telephone uh, interview, or maybe a video conference could be some of the possibilities. Uh, and based on experiences, uh, it has a high response rate. Uh, that's according to different experts, according to experiences. Next is in terms of questionnaire. So it can be a paper and pencil 
or maybe a computerized one. But according to experts, according to experiences of experts, questionnaire has a low return rate. Next is assurance of remaining anonymous. So when you are going to collect data in terms of a questionnaire, you don't need to have their name, but you are going to code on paper number one, paper number two, Questionnaire number one, questionnaire number two, number three, so forth and so on. So you can only see the code number. So that there is no point of ID. And data, you strictly keep the data confidential because the name in there is not reflected in the questionnaire. And then you have to have a list, no? Who is the owner of paper number one? Who is the owner of paper number two? with the owner of paper number three, so forth and so on. Then the data collection. So checklist. When you say checklist, there is a list and you are going to check on the specific behavior, the specific characteristic, or the specific uh, response uh, that uh, would reflect or applicable in your own perspective. So from the word checklist, so the list is there and you are going to check what is applicable to you. Limited information. Okay? Observe or not observe. Very limited. However, if you are going to expand these uh, choices, you can actually have uh, frequently observe, then moderately observe, then slightly observe, then not observe at all. So that becomes unlimited information. Because... Uh, Observation as to observe or not observe, these are just very limited. Because when we observe, we can quantify that one also as to frequently observe or maybe always observe or maybe almost always observe. Then uh, you're going to have uh, uh, rarely observe and then not observe. If not rarely, you can have always observe, almost always observe, then slightly observe, then not observe at all. But then again, when you are going to make uh, the scaling, you have to be back up with related literature. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Then your justification, because I saw, I have read the related literature that the scaling is this one. No? Frequently observe, moderately observe, slightly observe, then not observe at all. But then again, I go back to my previous discussion. When you have that scale frequently observe, you have to define what do you mean by frequently observe. When you have moderately observe as the scale, you have to define what does it mean when we say frequently, moderately observe, slightly observe, or not observe at all. So each scale has a definition, a concrete definition that you are going to discuss that one with the respondents or with the subjects of the study. Because if you do that, then your respondents, your subjects, and yourself as the researcher have the same understanding about frequently observed, moderately observed, slightly observed, then not observed at all. I mentioned earlier, that no two individuals are exactly the same. So you need to specify that. Forget your own definition about the different scale, but use my own definition. I'm the researcher, so all must follow my definition of uh, the following scale. The same to rating scale, no? Never to always. So, so why do you say never then uh, to almost never, then uh, to almost always, then always, because you are back up with the related literature. So all the time, when you have a rating scale, do not just create it based on your stock knowledge, but create it because you have some justifications. And your justification is the, re the related literature. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Because I have read the work of so-and-so and, -so, and they're doing about this. 
data collection may be ordinal or may be interval. Actually, in research and in statistics, we have four levels of measurement. So the first level is nominal. The second is ordinal. The third one is interval. And the last one, the highest one, is all about ratio. So we have nominal, ordinal, interval, and then ratio. So they follow in a definite order. The lowest one is nominal, followed by or ordinal, number two. Number three is uh, interval. Number four is ratio. They follow in a definite order. So what is meant by nominal? Nominal is actually classification only for identification purposes. For example, sex. So male and then female as the possible values. So you code one for male, then two for female. So we use numbers. So one for male, then two for female. So one and two have no numerical values, but one is used to identify a male, then two is used to identify a female or to classify a male or a female. So you use one and two. You don't have numerical values, but the numerical values are just used for classification purposes. Plate numbers, for example, ID numbers, room numbers, building numbers, apartment numbers, zip codes. They are just numbers without numerical values. But those numbers are just to identify or to classify. For example, plate number. So this is a certain plate number is identifying that this is owned by blah, blah, blah. The zip code 6,200, this would identify that the mail is for Dumaguete. Si Bulan 6,201, that classifies that the mail is for that place, no? si Bulan. So the 6,200, the 6,201 have no numerical values, but they are only used for classification or identification purposes. Next one is ordinal. In the ordinal level, there is still nominal. You can still find classification or identification purposes. However, there is an additional characteristic, the ranking or the ordering. There is a possibility of ranking. There is a possibility of ordering. So for example, the K to program of the Department of Education. So kindergarten is one classification. Grade two is one classification. Grade three is another classification. So forth and so on up to grade 12. So there is classification. There is identification. So that's nominal. However, it does not stay to nominal. It goes to higher level, which we call interval. Because uh, when we look at kindergarten up to grade 12, there is what we call a ranking or ordering. We follow specific order, kindergarten, grade 1, grade 2, up to grade 12. Definite order or in a specific order. So we call that one as part of the, inter the ordinal scale. So we look up into performance rating, excellent, very good, good, fair, and then poor. So all of those are actually in terms of classification. Excellent is different, very good is different, poor is different. However, there is additional characteristic. There is ranking or ordering. From excellent down to poor, there is what we call ranking. There is what we call ordering. So that's why we call that one as part of ordinal level. Then we go to the interval scale. In the interval scale, there is still nominal characteristic. There is still ordinal characteristic. Plus one additional factor, which we call the meaning of zero. That the presence of zero does not mean nothing. The meaning of zero in the interval scale, there is a value and the value is equal to zero. So what does it mean? Uh, someone is uh, not muting uh, the microphone. So kind of turn it off. Uh, so can you check your microphone? So some microphones are not muted. No? So kind of mute your microphone. 
Because if you don't mute, I'm going to remove you from the panel. So zero in the interval does not mean nothing or no value at all. But the zero in the interval has a value and that value is zero. What does it mean? For example, in chemistry, we have degree Celsius, degree Fahrenheit as the unit of temperature. So if you have a temperature zero degree Celsius, it does not mean that there's no temperature. There is a temperature and the temperature is zero degree Celsius. If uh, the temperature is zero degree Fahrenheit, it does not mean that there is no temperature. The temperature is zero degree Fahrenheit and that's a value because we have to take note that a temperature can be positive, can be negative, or can be zero. So a zero degree Celsius or a zero degree Fahrenheit does not mean nothing or no temperature at all, but it means there is a temperature. And what is the temperature? Zero degree Celsius or zero degree Fahrenheit. So that's what we mean by interval. Now there might be a possibility that the variable has a zero value, but that zero does not mean nothing or no value at all. When we look at into an exam, a chapter exam, for example, and someone gets a zero, it does not mean that, uh, that someone does not learn something from the chapter. That zero does not mean nothing. That zero means uh, there is learning. But maybe what is learned did not come out in the exam. So we could never so we could never say that there is no learning at all. There might be some learnings, but what has been learned did not come out in the exam. That's why zero does not mean nothing in the interval scale. And then we go to the ratio. In the ratio, Still, there is nominal, there is ordinal, plus one characteristic about the possibility of having a zero value. However, in the ratio, the meaning of zero as a value means uh, nothing, no value at all. So if, for example, the variable is number of trees found in a certain location. But when you look at the number of trees in a certain location, no trees at all. Then you are going to have there number of trees in Z location or in the A location is equal to zero. Why zero? Because you don't see any tree in that location. So the number of trees in that location is equal to zero. So the zero there means nothing or no value at all. When you look at number of people living in a building, but when you go to that building, uh, there is no one in there. No one is living. No one is occupying. Then you are going to say number of people residing in the building is equal to zero. And that zero is a real zero, meaning there is no value at all. Nothing or no value at all. So take note of the differences uh, between and among nominal, ordinal, interval, and the ratio scale and they follow in a definite order then we look at into a rubric so of course you know what is a holistic rubric and what is an analytic rubric as uh, the two basic divisions or categories of a rubric okay. then i'm going to skip this one computerizing observations because we have so many software that would computerize the observation, the data collection can be through the use of technology. Then conducting interviews in a quantitative study. So the first one asks questions that help answer the research question. It does not mean that the research questions found in the statement of the problem will also be the questions that you are going to ask in the interview or in the questionnaire. No, that must be something different. And you are going to find indicators that would actually give indirect questions to 
indirect answer is to the statement of the problem. And how do you do that? You're going to have a comprehensive or intensive review of related literature. Because when you do the review of related literature, you might be able to encounter similar instruments. So you can get ideas from that similar instrument and then create your own. Write questions with quantifiable answers. So dapat numerical. Ang data to be collected. And if it is not numerical, there might be conversion from qualitative to quantitative data. Then restrict questions to a single idea. So when you are going to have the statements to be rated, to be asked, so dapat it must be a simple sentence only or a sentence that has only one focus. We always discourage about uh, compound sentences, compound complex uh, sentences. You have to consider that each statement is only addressing one perspective or one consideration. Not two nor three. Each must have only one focus. Number four, consider, consider asking a few questions to elicit qualitative data. So, for example, you ask on how effective is the training program? So you have their very effective, then moderately effective, slightly effective, then not effective at all. So that you have a better understanding of the responses, you can ask, provide a justification. So why? Why very effective? Why very why slightly effective why moderately effective why not effective at all so at least you have a quantitative data being collected plus the justification why they say very effective why they say not effective why they say slightly effective why they say moderately effective then use a computer to streamline the process. So for now, we have different softwares, we have different technology to have uh, some of the digitization of uh, the conduct of the interview. Number six, conduct pilot uh, testing. No? Conduct uh, pilot uh, testing. But before the conduct of pilot testing, you have to develop your own instrument. Especially if you could not borrow an instrument to be used in the data collection. You can only have that one when you do have the review of related literature. That uh, when, do ha when you have the comprehensive review of related literature, you might be able to find an instrument that is exactly the same to what you want to collect uh, in your own study. So you can borrow that one. However, if you could not borrow, there is no similar instrument, then you have to create your own. When you create your own, so you have now created the, the instrument. But remember, you could not create that one if you don't have a review of related literature, a very comprehensive review of related literature. Because reading the instrument from Maria's work, reading the instrument from uh, Juan's work, Reading the instrument from Nancy's work will give you an idea on what are the things that you are going to incorporate in the items of your instrument. Then, after that, you have the initial draft of your uh, questionnaire. Then you are going to validate uh, your instrument. No? So how will you validate? You need to have uh, three experts. No? As a common practice, you need to have three experts. Uh, and we have to define what is an expert. If we look at science teaching, for example, or math teaching, then you look at into an expert, uh, na science teacher. So pag science teacher, we have to look at into master teacher one, master teacher two, master teacher three, or master teacher four. Because having that position would actually tell na that someone has an expertise. If that is in a university level, dapat professorial ang iya ang item or position not in the case that uh, you just actually call him a professor but actually not no 
because there is what we call a ranking in the university. When can you be classified as a professor? No? In the university, we have instructor, we have assistant professor, we have associate professor, then the full professor, one, two, six, then the university professor. So if they are already professors, then they could be experts. Then the educational qualification, at least master's degree holder. If not, doctorate degree holder. Then you look at also the publication of that someone. And then you look at also an expert in statistics. Then you need to look at also an expert in research methodology. Because all of these would constitute the experts that would look at into your instrument. You might develop the instrument and you believe all the items there are relevant to the statement of the problem. But when experts would look at those different items, then they would say, this is lacking. This item must be deleted. This one is not relevant. This one is not necessary. Add more items. So you have to follow the comments of the experts and then incorporate the comments, suggestions of the experts. So once you have the draft that you have incorporated already, the comments, the suggestions of the experts, then you are going to present again the final draft of your instrument to the expert so that the expert can examine on whether what they have suggested, what they have actually commented are actually being in there. And then ask a certification from that expert that your paper has undergone a thorough validation from that expert. So when you have the final draft that is not yet the final one, you do the conduct of pilot testing. What is the purpose of pilot testing? Pilot testing is actually looking into the readability and understandability of the items of the questionnaire. Remember, if I were the researcher and uh, if I were the one who developed the instrument, so my reading ability, my understanding ability is different from the understanding ability of the grade 7 students or the basic education students. So I might have used words which could not be understood by grade 7 or grade 11 or grade 12. To be sure that all items are understandable, readable by the concerned respondents, then do the pilot testing. The pilot testing should be done in another population. For example, the target population is senior high school students in Dumaguete. You could not do the pilot testing within Dumaguete Senior High School because that's actually the final target. However, you can go to another city. You can go to Bai City and then pilot test that one to senior high school students in Bai City. Or maybe you go to Tanhai City. Or maybe you go to Bayawan City. So there must be similarity. Senior high school in a city must be also a senior high school in another city. Not in the case that you go to Bakong, senior high school in Bakong or senior high school in Sibulan because our basic similarity is in terms of city, not in terms of a municipality. Remember, the characteristic of a city and the characteristic of a municipality is having a difference. So that's it. If uh, your pilot, uh, your target population is Dumaguete senior high school students, you can do that one senior high school students in Tanhai or senior high school students in Baiz or Bayawan. <laughs> Next, uh, when you do the pilot uh, testing, have someone to observe. You're the one administering the pilot testing. Have someone... Uh, to record everything that happens in the conduct of the pilot testing. So for example, uh, you have someone to record on what's happening the entire pilot testing. So if, for example, 
During the conduct of the pilot testing, many are asking clarifications about the direction. Then that means there is an indicator that the direction is not clear. So that will give you an idea that you have to revise the direction. You are going to improve the direction because uh, many are asking clarifications during the pilot uh, testing. If not in terms of the direction, maybe on a specific item. That they are not able to understand a certain item. Maybe number three, maybe number seven, maybe number eight. So that has to be recorded so that when you do the final revision, you are going to reflect on those different items and find ways and means to improve that one in such a way that it would become more understandable, more readable on the part of the final respondents. So you're not after of the answers, but you're after on what has what had happened during the conduct of the pilot testing. Is there a clarification? Are there many questions about the different items? So we look up into readability, understandability of the direction and the different items of the instrument. Another one is looking into the duration of the conduct of the, the, the answering of the questionnaire. When you ask permission, you might be asked by the superintendent, how long will it take? Then maybe you can say around 30 minutes or around an hour. But if you don't do pilot testing, then that is never true. Because there might be a case it's almost 30 minutes, but none of the respondents is able to finish answering the questionnaire. Or maybe... You said almost an hour, but after 20 minutes, all are able to answer the questionnaire. So there is something wrong on what you said. To be most accurate, you're going to do the pilot testing. So during the pilot testing, you're going to record the time it starts, and then you're going to record the time it ends. So that when you do the, the duration of the the actual administration, you can exactly tell at most 30 minutes based on your pilot testing or maybe at most one hour based on your pilot testing. It might not be exactly one hour. It might not be exactly 30 minutes, but very close to 30 minutes or very close to one hour. Why it is very close to one hour? Why it is very close to 30 minutes? Because you did a pilot testing. It actually happened during the pilot testing. So you can predict now when you give that one to your final respondents, it is still almost 30 minutes or it is still almost one hour based on the pilot testing result. Mm -hmm. Number seven, introduce yourself and explain the purpose of the study. Very common in a letter, you only say, I am a graduating student or I am a third-year student. I'm conducting a research entitled blah, blah, blah. So that never captures the interest and the motivation and the rapport of uh, the respondents or the subjects of the study. So what if you are conducting the study? So what if you are a graduating student? So what if you are a student of Negros Oriental State University conducting this kind of study? So that's not actually a good indicator. However, when you are going to introduce uh, yourself, introduce also the purpose of the study. That you are going to conduct the study with the following purposes. And you are going to indicate what benefits can the respondents get out of the findings of the study. Because if they do not know what are the benefits, what are the purposes of the study, then that would lead to situation, they would not answer that one as honest as they could. And that would not motivate them to answer the questionnaire or to participate in the study. So you have to take note about it. Then be sure that participants offer informed consent in writing. So informed consent is actually very important when you do, when you do data collection and when you do about interviews and then when you do 
the collection of data in terms of a questionnaire. So let me switch a slide. I'm going to show a specific example of informed consent. Do you see the document that I am sharing? Yes, though. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, though. So this is a sample informed consent to one of the researches that we conducted here in the College of Teacher Education. The study was all about case assessment among the senior citizen of Kalindagan, Dumaguete City, basis for a functional intervention program. So, in the informed consent, there must be an introduction. So, in the introduction, the College of Teacher Education of Negros Oriental State University Main Campus 1 and the Barangay Officials of Kalindagan, Dumaguete State support the practice of uh, protection for human subjects participating in any form of research. So, it's actually by law that we are going to protect uh, the human subjects in any type of participation in any form of research. The following information is provided for you to decide whether you wish to participate in the present study. You may refuse to sign this, inform this form and not participate in the study. You should be aware that even if you agree to participate, you are free to withdraw at any time. If you do withdraw from this study, it will affect your relationship with the aforementioned agencies. So these are actually the major components of having an introduction. Next is you have to indicate the purpose of the study. So in this case, uh, to collect data about the needs of the senior citizens of Kalindagan, Dumaguete City, with an end view of proposing functional intervention programs. Then the procedures. You will be asked to answer the items in the attached questionnaire. And during this process, audio video recordings will be taken as an additional tool for the collection of data. You have the option of having taping stop at any time. Video audio recording will be transcribed by the research committee. Head by myself because uh, I was the head of this research. I was the lead researcher. Then rest assured that video audio recordings will be stored with utmost confidentiality or security. And even if and when necessary, the recordings will be erased or. Yeah. So these are the procedures no, of uh, the entire research process. Benefits. The research participants will be the direct beneficiaries of the functional intervention program that can be developed from this needs assessment research. Then you have to indicate also the payment to participants. So in this study, we did not have any funding, so we did not give any payment to the respondents. However, in some funded researches, there is a corresponding payment to participants. So it is clearly stated in this part uh, 
the research participants will not receive any payment in participating in this study. Then participant confidentiality. Your name will not be associated in any publication or presentation with the information collected about you or with the research findings from this study. Instead, the researchers will use a study number or a pseudonym rather than your name. So there's a coding no? or a number identification for yourself as participants of the study. Your identifiable information will not be shared unless letter A, it is required by law or university policy, or B, you give written permission. Permission is granted on this day to use and disclose your information remains in effect indefinitely. By signing this form, you give permission for the use and disclosure of your information for purposes of this study at any time in the future. So that's all about participant confidentiality. Refusal to sign consent and authorization. You are not required to sign this consent and you may refuse to do so without affecting your right to any services you are receiving or may receive from the functional program that can be developed from this study. However, if you refuse to sign, you cannot participate in this study. So in this study, some senior citizens of Kalindagan did not participate. But when we have the functional program, all of the senior citizens in Kalindagan were able to benefit that one. It does not mean that they did not participate, so they could not also benefit the, the functional program. All are able to benefit the, the functional program, even if they did not participate in the study. Then, canceling this consent and authorization. You may withdraw your consent to participate in this study at any time. So, cancellation can be done at any time. You also have the right to cancel your information permission to the use and disclose further information collected about you in writing at any time by sending your written request to uh, myself, uh, being the research coordinator of the College of Teacher Education, Negros Oriental State University, and being the lead researcher. If you cancel permission to use your information, the researcher will stop collecting additional information about you. However, the research team may use the undisclosed information that was gathered before they receive your cancellation as described above. So for example, the start of the research was uh, way back October. So October, you participated. November, you participated. But on December 1, you decided to stop uh, participating. And then uh, you sent the, a letter to the head or to the lead researcher that you are going to stop your participation. That is totally okay. That is uh, permissible. But uh, if you stop only for December, then we can still make use of the data collected October and then November because you permit us uh, to be part of that you would be part of uh, the study and we have collected data from you. But if you state in your request that all the data collected from you will should not be disclosed, should be not part of uh, the entire research, then that is still okay depending on your letter of request. Pwede not all the data collected from you will not be disclosed and will not be included in the analysis of the data. Or pwede you stop on December, then the data collected in October or November can still be part of our data collection in the data analysis and the data interpretation, depending on what you want. No, If you were the participants or the respondents of the study. Another section is about questions about participation should be incorporated in the informed consent. So in this case, it's actually me because I'm the research coordinator 
at the same time the lead researcher. Participant certification. So this is the nature of the certification. If you agree to participate in this study, please sign or indicated, then tear off uh, this section and return it to the data collectors. Keep the consent information for your records. Uh, I have read this consent, an authorization form. I have had the opportunity to ask and I receive, I have received answers too. Any questions I had uh, regarding the study and the use of and disclosure of information about me for the study. I agree to take part in this as a research participant. By my signature, I affirm that I am at least 60 years old and that I have received a copy of this consent. So print, uh, uh, print participant's name, then participant signature, then the date. So this is actually the participant uh, certification. So all in all, those are the components of the informed consent. Any clarification? Any clarification of the informed consent? Okay. None, so far. None so far. None so far. Sir. None so far sir. So your first assignment is to make an informed consent and no? then submit that one on Thursday. So that's individual and that is actually based on your research uh, proposal. Just hold on for a moment. Are you seeing again my slides? Yes, no. yes no. Okay. So that's number eight. Now, number nine, ask controversial questions in the latter part of the interview. Should you have controversial questions that should be in the latter part of the interview, the last one. Then 10, seek clarifying information as needed. So you clarify something then clarify that one directly based on the interview process. Then constructing a questionnaire. So number one, keep it short. Dapat the questionnaire must be short. If there is a long one, then it would take a long time also to answer those different questions. And some of the participants, some of the respondents would not read actually the entire item if that is actually a very long questionnaire. And if there is a very long one, you would not get the accurate answer because no one would spend time just to read all the items. Uh, remember that all respondents are busy. They could not afford to give two hours just, in, just to answer the items of your questionnaire. So much as possible, keep it short. Number two, keep the respondents uh, simple. Number three, provide specific instructions. So instructions must be what? Very specific, understandable, readable, understandable. Number four, use simple, clear, unambiguous language. So the bottom line is use simple words, very common words that can be understood by the respondents or the subjects of the study. Number five, give a rationale to any item for which the purpose is unclear. Every item that you have in the research question is pen has and it turn off your microphone. <laughs> Pati 
Are you still seeing my uh, slide? Yes, yes Dr. Yes, Dr. So if you're not mindful of your microphone, I'm going to totally remove you from the panel. Number six, uh, check for unwarranted assumptions implicit in the question. So there might be a case that you assume uh, that's understandable. You might assume uh, the scale is actually well-defined. So dapat you're going to have a well-defined definition of the variable, the scale, and you are not going to assume that everyone is able to understand that one. So have an expert to validate what you have written in the questionnaire. That, uh, when you say excellent, define what is excellent based on your study. Define what is very good in your study so that everyone will have the same understanding. Do not assume that everyone have the same understanding about the scales that uh, you use. Seven, word your questions in ways that don't give clues about preferred or more desirable responses. Do not actually give an item or write an item that is leading to a positive response or a negative response. So there must be neutrality of the statements that you have in the questionnaire. Number eight, determine in advance how will you code the responses. So how will you code that one? So, for example, performance, very good, excellent, very good, good, fair, and then poor. So, have the coding. Five, excellent, four, very good, three, good, two, fair, one, poor. But still, the coding must be based on related literature. You could not just say, because this is what I like. You could not just say, this is what I want to happen. But all that you do must be back up with related literature. Then nine, check for consistency. You know? Check for consistency. So consistency of the responses, consistency of the possible responses, consistency of the rating scale, you know? consistency of all the terms that you use uh, in the different items of the questionnaire. So writing skills are very important because if you don't have the writing skills, the writing abilities, then you could not be consistent. Number 10, conduct one or more pilot tests to determine the validity of your questionnaire. It does not mean that you are going to have only one pilot testing because it would not give a better idea on whether it is readable, understandable, that this one could be finished around 30 minutes or could be finished around an hour. But the more pilot testing that you do, the greater is the validity or accuracy of the understandability, readability, and the time allocation is more accurate because you did many pilot testing. Number 11. Scrutinize the almost final product to make sure it addresses your needs. So when you have the final draft, see to it that all of those items will provide possible answers to the statement of the problem. That all of these uh, items uh, will give data that would answer problem number one, problem number two, up to the last statement of the problem. Number 12, make the questionnaire attractive and professional. So if the questionnaire is actually not attractive, like in my case, I'm very biased. If the instrument is not attractive, I would not answer that one immediately. And that would not motivate me to answer the questionnaire because the appearance is not attractive. Instead, uh, there's proper margining, proper spacing, uh, then... Uh, I could not see that one. It's photocopied by 50 cents. No? So, mga itom, blocks, and the production is not that good. So, it does not capture the attention of uh, the respondents or the subjects of the study. It must be attractive and professional looking. That uh, when we look at the questionnaire, it appears uh, very attractive. Margining is good. Spacing is actually good. Uh, paraphrasing is actually good. And then uh, there's no grammatical error. 
and actually in the right appropriate right or appropriate font size and then font that type not too small nor too big and there are no erasures in there proper spacing so dapat naka single space when you have the questionnaire delete siya double space if you have a table then dapat properly constructed ang table Then using technology, I will skip that one because uh, I know that you are much better than me in using technology no, for questionnaires. The very common that we have uh, is actually on uh, Google Forms. Then maximizing the return rate. So consider the timing. Avoid uh, holidays and vacation times because people are so busy. Then if you do that... Uh, then uh, you might not be able to have a return or a retrieval of the questionnaire. Make a good first impression. So dapat your appearance must be impressive so that uh, your questionnaire can be answered the soonest possible time. Like in my case, uh, if uh, the one collecting the data is not impressive in terms of attitude, in terms of appearance, that could be one of my biases. No? Number three, motivate potential respondents. Uh, write a great cover letter. So the same to what I said, do not just say, I am a graduating student, I am a researcher conducting the study. Then nothing follows. You have to tell what's the purpose of the study. What benefits can they get from that study? And knowing the benefits, knowing the purposes, uh, then that would capture the attention of uh, the respondent that they have to answer the, the questions as honest as they could because they can benefit that one and they know the purposes of the study. Include the self-address envelope with prepaid postage. Why? Because if uh, there's no self-address envelope uh, and no prepaid postage, then if I were the concern, I should not go to the post office. I should not spend my own money just to return the questionnaire. That's the obligation of the researcher. That's the obligation of the data collector. Then if mailing, then if mailing, uh, your question includes self-address envelope with return package. Normally in our case, no, in my own experience as a researcher, when we did data collection all throughout Region 7, we have enclosed uh, a return uh, LBC package or maybe a JRS package that is totally paid by myself as the researcher or being paid by the research team. And that would actually maximize the return rate. Number five, offer the results of your study. So in your letter, you have to include that when the study is completed, uh, you being the researcher will give a copy of the results of the study because they can benefit, but how can they benefit if you don't give a copy of your study? Or you can even go there and present the findings of your study. Number six, be gently persistent. Consider sending two follow-up reminders. Sending reminders a week or two weeks after the previous mailing. Not in the case that you have a reminder every hour, you have a reminder morning, afternoon, evening. No, that's not good. But then again, be sure to be back up with the relevant literature. Why do you do a daily follow-up? Why do you do a weekly follow-up? So forth and so on. And then your answer is, because I have read a literature that this is actually giving a maximum return rate no? during the process uh, doing this step, doing this process will maximize the return rate. So it's not only coming from your own idea, but that is backed up with the related literature. So I'll stop here. I'll stop here. I'll stop to maximizing the return rate. So your assignment, your assignment for Thursday, Thursday, so number one, I mentioned that one, informed consent. Number two, I want you to have a research article that uses observation study. Then number three, I want you to have a research article that uses cross-sectional study. And then 
Number four, another research article that uses longitudinal research design. And the last one is a research article that uses survey research design. So I repeat for emphasis, assignment for Thursday. Number one, informed consent based on the explanation that I did a while ago. And uh, the informed consent must be encoded and based on your research proposal. Then uh, number two, a research article that uses observational studies. Then number three, a research article that uh, uses uh, cross-sectional research design. Next is uh, a, re a research article that uses longitudinal research design. And the last one, a research article that uses survey research design. Then plus another one, a research article that uses correlational research design. So I repeat, no? number one, the informed consent. Number two, research article that uses uh, observational research design. Number three, a research article that uses cross-sectional. Number four, a research article that uses longitudinal research design. Number five, a research article that uh, uses survey research design. Number six, a research article that uses uh, uh, correlational research design. So you are going to staple each research article. Informed consent, staple that one. Then each research article, staple that one. When I say research article, dapat it is an article coming from a journal that I see the title of uh, the article, the author, the abstract, the introduction, so forth and so on, up to the reference section. So I repeat, when I say research article, I mean about the, the title of the research article, the author or authors, the abstract, the introduction, then the other parts of the article up to the references. That is what I mean by a research article. So at the last page of each research article, you are going to handwrite, no? how the researcher used the design. For example, a research article that uses correlational research design. You are going to explain in handwritten format uh, on how did the researcher use correlational research design in the research article. If that is an article that uses survey research design at the back page of the last page of the printed research article, you are going to explain there how the researcher used correlational research design or a survey research design. So the discussion must be handwritten and all must be submitted on Thursday. We're going to have a graded recitation on Thursday about the assignment. So is that clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, any sir. clarification of the assignment? Any clarification of the assignment? Doc, excuse me, the assignment will be individual or will it be by pair? The assignment is individual. Okay, the assignment is individual. The graded recitation is also individual. And all assignments must be submitted on Thursday during our class uh, meeting. Excuse me, uh, sir. Go ahead. Uh, I have uh, some clarification about the informed consent. We have to make our own informed Based on the discussion that I mentioned a while ago. Okay? okay. Thank you, sir. Do not make your own, but follow what I discussed a while ago about informed consent. Any other clarification? Nine. Hi, excuse me, Doc. Uh, will ahead. you be sending us a copy of the informed consent that you presented earlier? No. Some of my classmates weren't able to screenshot, Doc, because they're having difficulties with their data. But that is actually part of the obligation. 
Sige, Doc. Thank you. Okay. So, kindly turn on your camera for the last checking of the attendance. Okay, show your best smile. So, to those who were not able to, you can turn off now your camera. To those who were not able to have a screenshot, so kindly ask from your classmates who have the screenshots of my discussion. Okay? So, have a sharing of uh, resources. So, I know some of you have a complete screens uh, screenshots. So, share that one with your classmates. So, thank you for attending this virtual class. No? And uh, if there are no clarifications, I'm ending this virtual class. No? Thank you for spending the night uh, with this special class. If you have some clarifications, you. you can see me in the office. Uh, we're going to have also the continuation of the graded recitation of the RRL no? as part two of the midterm exam. Should you have some clarifications of our discussion tonight, then you can ask clarifications from me tomorrow. Uh, I'm available in the morning until afternoon or even evening no? for any clarification. So is that clear to everyone? Yes, yes no. no. Okay. Yes, no. So happy evening, everyone. And thank you very much for spending the night just to attend uh, this uh, special virtual class. Uh, okay, everyone. Advice her. Advice her. Advice her. Thank you, sir. Advice her. Advice her. See you tomorrow.